Welcome to the Den of Discussion. I'm your host, Douglas Robbins. Today, we're speaking with author Vance Newdorf, who has completed a, a fantasy series and has also planted over a half million trees. Welcome, Vance. How are you? I'm doing just fine. It's great to be here with you this morning. Nice to speak with you. So, first of all, before we get into the writing, tell me about the trees. I'm fascinated that you, I think, over eight summers, you planted a half a million trees. Why? And... How are you doing? I mean, a half a million trees that were using a machine. How are you getting this done? No, it is simply done with a shovel. It's a tree planting shovel. I still have a couple of them. Uh, they're rather short, uh, about a meter long. And they are done on just the ground. Sometimes it's just a tangled mess of when they do the clear cut logging. Uh, this is in British Columbia. Yeah. The company that does the logging is required by law to replant all those trees. Okay. So then they hire summer students, which I was at the time, and you do these seasons starting in the spring and going through summer. And they put you out in the middle of nowhere on these blocks that have been logged. And they give you boxes of trees with very strict regulations on keeping them cool and alive and the rest of it. And then you just spend days. And in our day, seven days a week, 12 to 14 hours a day, you go out there with a shovel and you screef, which is to kick a spot of clear dirt in the middle of all the rubble. Uh, you put your shovel in, you open up that hole, you have a tree with these bare roots hanging down, and you get that all down into the hole, nicely planted. You kick that shut, make sure it's all nice, and then you find an exact measurement to plant the next one. And they will come in and check that there's not too many trees in a circle. They'll make sure that none of the roots are showing. If you get less than 80% accuracy, you don't get paid. So it was, a, it was kind of an intense job, a very uh you know rigorous uh you got very close to the people that you worked with it was like being in a kind of an army situation living in these tents uh you know there's no breaks in the early days we didn't even have showers we were filthy uh, we didn't have good food or sanitation and we got sick at times uh, it's really changed now now it's a regular work camp but uh over those years uh, i ended up with just over half a million uh, my best day i think was 2700 in a day wow yeah, a lot of fun. This, this plant, <laughs> this uh, tree planting device or instrument, how many is it planting each time? Well, it's just one. So it's you. Oh. You are you are by yourself, sometimes with a few bears roaming around. and uh, But you are by yourself out in the middle of nowhere. There might be someone planting within shouting distance of you. You're by yourself. You have your tree planting shovel in your hand. You have these great big bags buckled around your waist that are just full of probably, you know, 60 to 100 pounds of uh, trees that are being kept moist and the rest of it all together. And then you just head out and you start wow. planting in circles, in lines, whatever it might be. Sometimes we used to do what's called line planting. If the ground was clear enough, uh, and there wasn't many trees or logs and old junk in the way. We would all get together in a line, and then we'd spend the day visiting, singing, doing whatever as we planted in the line. So, yeah, it's it's still going on. It's a fascinating piece, uh, yeah. and virtually unknown. Very few people realize it's happening. Well, I, I used to live out west, as I've seen a lot of those those clear cuts, those hillsides right. that are clear cut. It's such a a brutal scar. Yes. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a lot of landslides and mudslides because there's no more roots holding it up. Um, so I didn't know that that was a practice. Yeah. They, I mean, I did that some 30 years ago and my trees uh, now outside of Prince George, I know where they're located. Uh, some of my trees are now being harvested and it, hmm. the cycle is just ongoing. And uh, it's kind of kind of a fascinating thing to look back and say, you know, in this particular day and age with um, all of the environmental concerns to say, you know, yeah. when someone says, are you carbon neutral? I go, oh man, I am carbon positive. Like right. I am all over the map. <laughs> you help the cause. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's really interesting. And again, one of those things you look back on and said, I did that. You know, what a yeah. fascinating period of your life, I'm sure. Well, and not only that, it, it became the, in some ways, as I, I say to people, it did in, in a way not ruin my life, but turn me into the somewhat machine mentality that I have even to today. Because when you're tree planting, it is, you you are getting paid per tree. You are trying yeah. to get as many of those in the ground as you can. 
Yeah. So you are, while you're screefing with your one foot, your shovel is going, you're opening a hole, your eyes are darting around trying to measure out a distance where the next one will be. You're thinking ahead sometimes two or three trees. Your mind goes. There's no time to stop this process. Yeah. And so coming out of that, uh, even as I approach my writing and the rest of my life, I am a very restless spirit. I can, while something is going on in my mind, I'm calculating, I'm working, I'm trying to get something else going. And for that reason, I just chase anything that comes along. I embrace it and go, okay, I'll try that. I'll try that. Yeah, boop, 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 boop. And I have so much fun because I do woodworking and cooking and try the guitar and whatever, <laughs> you know, it's, it's fascinating place to be. Um, there was a, one of the things I've done a project I did about five years ago, I found this ancient wisdom writer, 2,500 year old wisdom writer wrote a lot of interesting stuff and no one really paid much attention to him. So I retranslated the book and then I, by the time that was done, I memorized it. And then I talked to my theater friends and I made it into a show where I cooked over an open fire and created wow. a meal while reciting all 5,000 words. And then after that, I wrote a novelization of the author's life to try to communicate what he was saying. It was a great, fantastic project. Not very wow. popular, but uh, it's out there and it's a free audio book and people can listen to that one as well. Yeah. But following your inspiration, following yes. what excites you. Yeah, exactly. I and and I think that's what this wisdom writer when he said, whatever your hand finds to do, embrace it and throw everything you got at it. Like it's not a matter of career success or am I going to get there? What do you enjoy? Chase it. Yeah. And you know, that's just become kind of a, a thing I do. Yeah. And share it with the world if possible. So you have written um a series of books, I think three, uh over a half million words. And you even have the hammer, Vance's yes. hammer to prove it. Can you show uh, the audience the hammer? Yeah. It's not Thor's hammer. No, not Thor's hammer, but it is uh, because of my background in theater, I create props. So that's the hammer. Uh, this is uh, just had, oh, sorry, just had these done in, um, that's the medallion. So done in sterling silver. So I, I make these props to kind of help myself visualize as I write. I kind of write that way of putting creating a stage setting, put the actors on, watch what they do and document it or write it down. So I've done that, put it out there. And then uh, just this last year, I guess I'm coming up in almost a year, I decided, you know what? My grandkids' kids came to me and said, hey, dad, why don't you record the hammer for us? And I said, really? And they said, yeah, do it in your voice. Because that way when you're dead, yay, <laughs> yeah, very, very, very kind. Um, will have that recorded for us. And then I thought, well, why not just make it available online? And yeah. so there's people listening, following along. I'm just coming up now. I work on Buzzsprout and I'm coming up on 10,000 downloads. So it's kind of fun to see yeah. people yeah. engaging the work, liking. So yeah, I'm giving it away. It's there. And uh, I record chapters in my little sound booth, which is right here beside me. And then I put them up. And then uh, a little while ago, I got into, uh, somebody asked me some questions about how this came about, like, where did the story start? And it starts in, because I had a surgery in a hospital and then this instant kind of inspiration for a book. Um, and so I said, oh, I'll, I'll make these little podcasts, four minutes long, called Backspace Podcast. So like the Backspace key, where did this come from? And i am just recorded number 40 of those today. So th those are fun. Because it says, how does this quirky brain come up with that? So yeah. fun stuff. Yeah. Where, where, uh, where, since you brought, where can people find that download, that podcast? And um, what is the name of, of the fantasy book for, for people? So the, the fantasy book is called the Core Series. So that's C O R S E R I E S, Core Series. And it's on all podcast channels, Apple Podcasts, everywhere. Or you can just go to coreseries.com. And all the, all the, uh, what are we at? 120 episodes are all there to, uh, to enjoy if you wish. Is that, uh, are that, is that the entire series? That is where we're at so far. I, so I release a chapter a week, uh, and we are plus usually one pot backspace podcast a week. Uh, and we are good way where I think we're on chapter 38 of the medallion, which is book two. So we just roll along. It's it kind of interesting because it's kind of a, a radio play concept. It's kind of like yeah. 
a serialization. It's like kind of like um, you know Netflix, but instead of waiting for the next uh, piece of uh, you know the Mandalorian or whatever you're waiting for, you're We've instead been waiting, waiting a for long time for the Mandalorian. <laughs> I know. Yeah, we want them back, don't we? <laughs> yeah. So it it's kind of a a different take on how to produce a book, oral tradition stuff. You're right, and that, that's interesting, and that's a way to connect to people. How are people finding you? Are, are they just typing in fantasy? Because it's an unusual thing to have as a podcast. It is. It's very unusual, and uh, you know, because uh, obviously you can go to Audible and you can sign up. In fact, I think somehow I got on Audible. Uh, I don't know how because it's free. Uh, they're certainly not paying me anything for it, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, I've been told it's out there. Um, and then other than that, it's just word of mouth. Uh, I kind of, uh, because my, I have a kind of a creativity manifesto concept that I go by. And one of the uh, core values is this idea of community and being part of the community. And so far it's been people that have liked it. And then they Facebook and said, Hey, I'm listening to this. You should check out Vance and what he's doing. And then it just grows from there. Hmm. It's very interesting. Um, and you're just doing a regular recording. It's not an audible, um, you know, audible obviously is recorded and edited. And, yeah, I mean, I take it like a podcast. Yeah, I, I'm recording it. There's a little bit of intro music there. Uh, I would like someday if this is successful to then turn around and uh, if the resources were there to turn it actually into a radio play with yeah. Foley and sound effects and and uh, multiple right. players. Yeah, it'd be great fun. I'd love to do it, but that, we'll that see. Yeah. That's exciting, though. It is. That you found a niche or even created a niche. And, uh, one that you harkens back to, like you said, oral tradition. Yes. Uh, yeah, I look at that. In fact, it's interesting in this oral tradition concept that as I'm putting these out, and I welcome people, here's my email address. If you have a question, please ask it. And sometimes people have asked a question and it's triggered a thought and I go, yeah, you know what? There's a little bit of background missing there. It really should be there. And I'll actually go back into the chapter, rewrite that part, re-record it and replace the audio file. So now the listener has moved on to the next chapter. They've asked yeah. their question, they moved on. But the new listeners coming along will never know that they are now benefiting from those ones who came before yeah. them. And yeah. it's, it's, it's to me, it's an absolute fascinating concept because it's like sitting around a fire a thousand years ago and the story tells her tells a story and afterwards someone walks up to him and says i didn't get right. that part and he goes okay next time around the fire i'm gonna stick that right. part in and right. the story grew right they kept right. growing stories I, I it's fascinating it's funny it's almost like a beta listener and not a beta reader correct correct and i i theoretically i i think i'm doing something new enough that should open the door because there's a lot of good writers and thinkers out there that have great stories to tell but the current system of the way the publishing world works will never let them in the door they will yeah. they will not crack that door and that book that they have in their head or in their in their sock drawer won't go anywhere however if they took this approach and just started getting it out there taking feedback adjusting their text working it if they can get to a certain place where they're getting a lot of uh, activity and um people are listening and downloading, then they have the platform to go to a publisher or go straight to ebook and say, I've got this because everyone knows that the, um, the number of, you know, audiobook listeners is a fraction, you know, not, not super small, yeah. but of the ebook market. So if, if you can break into, let your folks help you hone your book to where it's going to be ready for an ebook version, which I think I'll get there once this is all done. Then talk to those folks that have already listened and say, by the way, the ebook's available on. And at that point in time, you can monetize your ebook and, and carry on. Yeah. That's a very interesting approach. So you don't, the books are published. I know you said not an ebook, but is it published, the, the book? Or So what, yeah, what I did, if you know, all, on Amazon or something. Yeah, not anymore. I mean, all those years ago, whatever it was, 10 or so now, uh, I did try to do the traditional route. And I papered my back of my office door with rejection slips, quite literally, top to bottom. Yeah. And um, 
So then I just said, you know what? I'm just going to do this myself. I'm not going to sit around here forever waiting for this. So I did go out, find a self-publishing printer, created my own publishing company, Novel Concept Books, and uh, printed book one and then toured it around to bookstores and had a riot. I made my own display with the black hammer and meeting really? people, talking to people. Oh, yeah, I had a great time. I love that interaction. But of course, when you do that and you're selling your own book in a bookstore, you know, they're taking whatever, 50 percent uh, and then plus in this, that, what, da, da, da. And so by the time you sell 20, 30 books at a bookstore thing, you got enough for gas and a donut on the way home. Mm. So, you know, life, real life intervened and I had to get the job I now have and uh, set that aside. So that I think I've got a couple boxes of those left. Uh, it's a nice looking book. Uh, it's got a flip book in one corner that I added in. Hammer spins around as you fan the pages. Um, I love creating stuff. So it doesn't owe me anything. So I took it off the print because I didn't have many of those left. Took it off Amazon and just said, I'll go do the audiobook. If it catches fire, I'll make it into ebooks. And then I'll put those up. Well, that's so interesting because obviously we want to make money from books, but really yeah. we want people to read them mm. and to really connect with them. Yes. And that's what you're doing. Yeah. And, and what better, what is more satisfying for an author? Like I said this to someone. The other day, I said, what's more satisfying for an author than to get feedback from a writer who's, or a reader or a listener who says, oh, I'm really loving this. I've got one real diehard fan in my local, local hometown, and he's always posting on Facebook, oh, the latest chapter, I love that. You can't. You can't beat that. There's no amount of money that can beat that personal interaction. And uh, so someone said, so, you know, you've got one person in a town of 3,000 or whatever at. Um, listening. That's not very good odds. And I said, hey, yeah, but extrapolate that over 2 billion English listeners out there. And we got a long way to go. You know, yeah. that, if it catches fire, that's hundreds of thousands of people that could also enjoy it. Yeah. But it's the one person at a time that really keeps you going. And, and Oh, yeah. yeah. Very much so. Very yeah. much so. So, uh, Van, so I see in your bio that it says, don't read the newspaper. Don't watch the news. Essentially disconnect from that. Um, you didn't say social media, but I'm going to add that in there. Um, why is that your approach? Or, or what, why are you encouraging people to disconnect or tune out, if you will? Well, and, and I guess I wouldn't say I'm encouraging. I would say more that for myself personally, I found that my brain uh, chases squirrels, rabbits so intently and so intensely that if I want to stay true to my ability to create the things that I want to create, I basically don't add in new mm -hmm. concepts. I, the, the macro stuff is always there, you know, that whatever people are talking about and sharing with you, you're always staying in touch with it. But to go in and just be constantly consuming new data, new stuff that does not figure yeah. into what I want to, my goals and my, my place where I'm going, yeah. doesn't make sense to me. So yeah. I have never in my life read a newspaper, watched a newscast. Uh, I have a radio in my car. I never turn it on. I leave it off because I have a 45-minute commute. And that's excellent planning and writing and brain time thinking through concepts and ideas and translating old books of wisdom and whatever all else. I, I just It's not that I want to be separate from everybody else. I want to be engaged, but engaged on my own terms, I guess is what I would say. Well, you know... There's much truth and wisdom in that because there's so and there's so much pollution now and noise and vitriol, <coughs> fake news, whatever. There's so much coming at us. Yes. That it can be all consuming and yeah. distract us from our own purposes, our own thoughts, because those thoughts are much louder. Yeah. When you hear people barking at each other and all these horrible things happening. It really triggers our own issues and blocks us from our own um inspiration so uh i try i've been actually i've been doing something called the 100 day challenge right yes I, and, I understand. and that is to be my best self most committed self and also to be off of social media you know i've been um you know putting podcasts out there but for the most part i haven't been looking yeah. at streams which are just like random stories Yes. It's not like, you know, a consistent thread. It's just random, arbitrary chaos. So I feel like it's been helping me um, focus on my own 
uh, projects uh, and also my own thoughts because yes. I'm not being bombarded. Um, so I see also in your bio that you had stopped writing for a few years. What, what and maybe your daughter had um, inspired you to to take it up again. Yeah, that was that was a funny one because I originally started writing the story for my son, and uh, we got partway into it, and uh, I was working on some new stuff, job, the rest of it. So I set the manuscript aside, and it eventually got packed away in a box and put in the crawl space over at her grandparents house they live in the same house with us and uh then one day my younger daughter shows up with his white band binder in hand and says i found this in the crawl space i said oh yeah yeah i was writing that for your brother i've kind of left that alone for the last little while and uh he lost interest i lost interest and she said well i read it and i said oh cool she said i really liked it and i went okay and then she says it's my birthday in two weeks will you write me the next chapter and I said, okay, I mean, what author would not just jump right. at that? Will you write me a chapter? Well, yeah. yeah, I'll write you a chapter. So I wrote her a chapter, gave it to her, and she came back and she said, it's good, but where's the girl? And I went, well, I was writing for your brother. How old was your daughter? Yeah. Uh, now she's 28. At the time, she probably would have been you no know, early teens. Okay. So, um, and uh, she said... Uh, will you uh, write a girl? And I said, sure. And the whole book, I went back to the beginning, put in Kate, who's now a, a huge player in book three, and uh, started. And then she said, okay, I like it. Will you finish it for Christmas? And I went, oh, man, um, <laughs> I don't know. Sure. And right. so I did. I hammered away on that thing uh, through that fall, finished it for Christmas. And that's when I first it was just a, it was a, like a project for the kids, but I had a friend that was an editor for a magazine and I said, will you look this over before I give it to her for Christmas? She looked it over and she came back and she said, this is actually a really good story. You should consider publishing it. And that's where I started down that road that kind of led to a dark, lonely place. But um, yeah, it's, it was a fascinating book started, book gets lost, book gets rediscovered, and then we move it out again. And now I've got grandkids that are coming along and saying, oh, yeah, what's happening with this and that? So, yeah, great fun. The Dark Lonely Place was because of the isolation that a writer endures or something else? Uh, the Dark Lonely Place was getting so excited about, oh, someone loves my book. Oh, an editor says it's good. Ah, oh, let's just move this forward, da, 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 and let's send it out there with the prospective, you know, the synopsis to all these publishers. And then yeah. that dark, lonely place was, like I said, sitting in my office. And then because I just thought I would do it, starting to tack the rejection letters to the back of my office door, which probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> but then, you know, you close your office door and, and you're looking at it and going, hmm, you're a failure. <laughs> So right. that was that's, not a that's good the noise, right? That's yeah, almost exactly. like looking at a newspaper. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Where do you where do you find you seem like to be a very inspired, happy, um, creative gentleman? Where do you where do you find this comes from for you? Well, I would say number one, the first thing was is that I don't consume all that negativity. Yeah, uh, I just can't. I, it's like our bodies, you know. Like if if you were constantly consuming uh, stuff, just stuffing it in, uh, you yeah. would start to get sick and bloated and not feel good. And I think mentally, uh, and there's a lot of talk now, of course, about mental health and the incredible stress of the last couple of years. You, you just cannot consume to that amount or level mentally and not have the same thing happen in your mind. So sure. you, you don't totally disconnect. You're not a hermit, but you are protecting your mind by saying, I will not sit there and just scroll through negativity, negative, negative, negative. So I limit that intake and try to stay in contact with people who are positive, who like to create, who can feed off each other and saying, what are you doing? What are you working on? A lot of long walks, you know, get outside, get some fresh air, you know, um, just it, trying to, you know, hiking, that sort of thing, getting outdoors and, and the natural world, finding some serenity and peace in that. Uh, I have a yard that looks out over toward the mountains. And this last year, 
I built myself. I always wanted to and had some extra time during this last two years. I built a timber framed gazebo house in my backyard and put a wood burning fireplace in there. So in the middle of winter, I, you know, I closed it in middle of winter. I can go out there. It's like a little cabin and it's a peaceful spot. Like I, I think we underestimate this, the role of peace and quiet in our own lives. And we're always turning something on. Like, where's the time to reflect and, and be quiet? Yeah, that, that's been a big focus of mine lately is, you know, as our, our society isn't really built from that, right? Our right. society is built from consumerism mm. uh, and labor. Yeah. And obviously the East is more, you know, built from that more philosophical approach uh, to living, even though much of the East is also very capitalistic and consumer based now. But I think a lot of people are finding that this model doesn't work very well. Right. Uh, to happiness or, or feeling fulfilled uh, or time with the family. Um, too much work. And it, it, you know, it's almost like a badge of courage. Oh, I work 60 hours. Well, I work 70 hours. And yeah. It's like, well, great. You're stressed out and you have, you know, your organs are shutting down or you have ailments, whatever. And I think a lot of people are finding, hmm, yeah, maybe that's not the best design of my life and time keeps ticking by. So hopefully, and you're seeing countries setting, you know, four day work weeks and a lot of people really revisiting this approach. So hopefully on a more macro scale, people are taking notice and taking stock and what do they care about? Well, they'd like to take some some walks in the woods and maybe work on some projects. And um, so that that's really exciting. Have you always been sort of that creative, inspired guy? Because it seems like you're sort of fearless with, you know, you just built a gazebo. I mean, you're, you're good at woodworking, but it seems like you're sort of fearless in these endeavors. Yeah. And that's, again, that ancient teaching of whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Um you throw yourself at it. Uh, you know, as a child, and I just did a Backspace podcast on this, uh, very kind of to myself and alone um, and always wanting to do something. My hands had to always be moving. And even as a toddler, tying string into, they would just give me a bundle of string and I would tie knots into this and try to make something. Lego, Lego came along and I was a Lego maniac before they even knew what that was. I was making fantastic stuff out of Lego when it was supposed to be just like for building little houses. Um, so that side of things really took off for me and kind of filled that void. Um, I was a very fortunate child. I lived on the side of a, a hill or a side of a mountain, actually, in British Columbia. Uh, our house was at the top of this snob hill, they called it. And I, the forest was in my backyard. And there was a reservoir with fish in there. I, and my parents were so busy that I could just roam around. You know, that's heavenly. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. Life of heaven. Yeah. And, and I, to this day, I still look at, you know, in my backyard, there's trees. And I would say to the kids, hey, go build a tree fort. And it just didn't seem to compute. Tree fort or Nintendo? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I would go, yeah, you know, make something, do something. So whatever comes along, I will give it my best shot. And I'll go, oh, let me try that. Uh, recently the kids came to me and with the grandkids and said, Hey, would you join us in a D and D game, uh, Dungeons and Dragons? And I yeah. said, okay, what do I do? And, uh, I think that curiosity, um, of saying, okay, how does that, what does that do? How does that work? And they tell you and go, Oh yeah, let me try that. Let me see if I can do that. And never being, I guess the biggest thing for me is never being afraid that it won't measure up because I am my own measurement. I am the only me that can create this book. Uh, my definition of excellence is the best you can go do with the time and resources you have available. And that's your excellent work. And who cares if other people look at it and say, oh, I don't like it. Oh, well, I did it for me. You don't have to like it. If you do, that's great. But you know, no no compunction on your part to, to love that thing. So yeah, it, it's, it's very freeing, I think, to be, say, I'll create and do whatever and, uh, you know, I'll golf and I won't be ever great, but I'll enjoy it. I'll write, I'll play the guitar, cook, <laughs> you name it. 
it seems that, and this will lead into my next question. It seems that just from speaking with you, that you follow inspiration and you essentially tune out anything that might be negative or, or counter to that. Is that, would you say like that's true in your career, your relationships, your life, things that are positive and exciting you do and things perhaps, I mean, for instance, a job, it seems like your job is something you love and perhaps that's often been the case with you. Well, and I think staying. Have you, what I'm asking also is, have there any been periods that you've been stuck? Because you don't seem like a gentleman who would be stuck. Well, I don't, I, because of when you have a wider or a broader sense of things to get involved with, if it's starting to peter out a little bit. So in my writing, I write every day. But if I'm hitting a little bit of a, a stalemate, I've got enough projects sitting right there that I can just switch. And some people say, you know, all oh, this ADHD thing or whatever it might be, you're just bouncing around, you're chasing squirrels. If they're good squirrels, what's the problem, right? right. And I, I definitely practice what I call moves management, which is as long as a project moves a little bit farther forward, it was farther forward. And right. that little amount, you know, so I tell people this, oh, I can't write, I can't write. And I said, well, can you write a hundred words in a day? And they'll say, yeah. I said, well, multiply that over a consistent year and you're or, getting on your way to a novella. You're, you're on your way. Yeah. That was Hemingway's line, you know, just write one good sentence of yourself because that just, it takes the pressure off. Yes. Uh, of saying, I have to do X, Y, Z. That's what I'll do. All right, Doug, just write 15 minutes. Yeah. And then once you start rolling, you're rolling. Yep. Let me ask you this. Have you ever had, and this is what I want to get, get out a little deeper. Have you ever had a job that you hated? Or were you ever stuck in something? Now, I don't mean writing you're stuck for a couple of days or whatever. Were you ever feeling trapped? Because you don't seem to be, you seem to be flowing. Yes. You seem to, inspiration, inspiration, if there's money there or not. And, and it seems like you have been able to sustain your life, if not thrive in it, following this inspiration and not being trapped into the modern situation of, oh, you know, dreading your job or just kind of slogging through the day? I would say, you know, I've had some longer term jobs and there was always opportunity for the most part to reinvent myself in the midst of that job. So that if I was starting to get bored or if it was kind of moving into a very static place, I could approach the powers that would be and say, you know, I think we need something over there and I'd like to try that out and let's see if it works. And for the most part, I had enough of a reputation they would let me try it. There was one situation where I was there for almost two decades doing a lot of that, uh, finding a lot of significance and meaning. And then it just kind of started spiraling in on itself to the point that when I was walking home, I'd go, you know what, this, this is not really going in the right direction. And that experience actually led to the, the company was having some real financial problems and folding in on itself. Anyways, that experience actually is what set me free then to go after the novel writing in earnest, because then they said, you know what, we got to let you off too. Things are not going well. Here's your severance package. See you later. You know, have the little luncheon and tea and say, you did great at your job. Great, great. And then I went, huh, I got enough here that I could actually pursue this book writing for a year and try selling the book. So I just segued over. And uh, I just, I think there's always, you know, looking for that opening or that crack or that place where you go, okay, I can't go there. That's not going anywhere, but what else is around? Oh, and again, it's that idea of things come your way, give it a shot. You know, don't wait for all the things to align and everything to get perfect. You just crack the door, peer inside and go, oh, yeah, there's something in there. Let's see, you know, stick my foot in a little bit and see what happens. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a complete plan. It's just a, ah, why not? Yeah. Well, I, I love that. And you're right. It can't be a complete plan. Like you don't have all no. the details, but you know that first piece. And that first piece is the first step. And that leads to the second step. Correct. Yeah. And and I would admit there's times in this audiobook project where, you know, I have to, when you're talking about not filling your head with negativity, uh, going on to your download stats, uh, and if you, I started finding myself doing that multiple times a day, and I was going, why are you doing this for? 
because you know you don't see anything moving or there's no new listeners coming in at the lower end in the first book the hammer and that goes for a few and you start getting all kind of oh this project is really going nowhere uh you got to just get your head down and say you know what shut that off for the next week check back in a week focus on what you're doing and don't let that you know tear you down so yeah it, it does require some focus to not get too caught up in your own kind of story of your own self and life and where things are going. Yeah. What is the definition of success to you? Uh, success again, for me is if I've, if I've done the best of my ability and then somebody, cause I, I'm definitely about, uh, an artist or a person that's creating wants someone to find that, look at it, find enjoyment and go, that does something for me. Uh, it's never totally in a vacuum. So to me, the idea of success is that someone is picking that up, enjoying it, telling somebody else, I enjoyed that. And the other people are coming along going, oh, I enjoy it too. And you're building a community around your work. And this this idea of, you know, enjoyment, uh, one of my core uh, kind of core values is this idea of celebration. If I can create a celebration for you, uh, whether that be food or an event. And uh, right now I'm actually designing and building a new art center where I live. And when that's done, we are going to have a full-on art center where we're going to marry culinary arts together with performance arts and we'll make food that matches the experience. So wow. as people come in, they'll have this great meal that will reflect then what they're going to go up into the studio to watch. And it'll all tie together into this experience. And as the person behind that, I'm the executive director there. If I can stand back and see smiles and visiting yeah. and community and hear laughter, uh, I just go bang on. You know, I can yeah. go, I'll go away from that with a big smile going, I did what I want to do. That, that That's beautiful, man, because you're doing what feels good and fills your heart. And simultaneously, you're helping the community and bringing yes. the arts together i mean that's and putting a smile on their face and whether you're doing it for legacy or not is is not really that important but you you know you yeah. it will last it will outlast you yes yeah and uh you know all of us know that we are transitory at best on this planet and uh you know people get forgotten very soon after they're gone but for me that moment of being there and um creating something that just brings this explosion of joy. Uh, I remember I designed the set for the play of Narnia and it was set in, uh, in Alaska, I think is where we put it. It was a kind of a, a will, a wilderness theme. And I created snow banks and rotating igloos and icicles that were here and the stuff falling from the sky. And uh, the director said, I want something that when the white witch says, I said snow, that some snow will fall down from the ceiling. And I said, okay, let me work with that a bit. I think there's something beyond, I, I get the effect. So what I created for him was a set of confetti cannons that stuck out, pointed out over the audience. And I just loved this thing that happened because the white witch would say, I said snow and woof, the entire theater Top to bottom was filled with falling snow, these little confetti pieces. Uh, the janitorial staff hated me. But it, it just filled the whole place. And the gasps and the children laughing and reaching for the little pieces falling down, it's just that is a defining moment for me of creativity and community building this huge celebration. And bang, there it is. It happens. Wonderful. Yeah. And you brought them into the show. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they experienced it. Yeah, it's beautiful. All right, so similar to um, your position on people not reading the newspapers and all that, uh, who are the what are the five people or five types of people that you try to avoid? Uh, I definitely avoid what I call the uh, the negative, uh, whatever name you want to put on there, negative Neds, negative Nancys, negative Nellies, well, whoever they are, if all they can do is pick things apart and find problems, it's not a good mindset. Uh, constructive criticism, hey, I like that part. Do you think you could do more of that? Wonderful. That's community. Yeah. 
Negativism is never community. It's the death of it. It's the killing of it. I avoid the people who are legalistic, uh, who say, here's the way everything must line out. And if you don't do this, you're not measuring up. And they live their whole within this closed box frame where there's no freedom to go out. Yeah. It is set. I, I've tried to avoid the legalists as well, the ones that are there. I avoid, and this might seem a little bit weird, I avoid lazy people. They, they drain me. Uh, if if we're working on a project together and they're just going to do their very base bit and, you know, no connection or kind of pushing into with everybody else to throw their hand into the mix, I avoid that. I kind of go, yeah, no, I, I, you're just going to drain me and I'm going to be frustrated with you. I, I try to avoid, I think in some ways, when you talked about consumers, people that just all they can talk about or do is what they're absorbing and there's never any out to me that uh, creativity and uh, taking things in it's like breathing so you breathe in eventually you should be breathing out you know mm -hmm. pop um, so if you're going to take all that information in what are you going to create out of that and um, I look at them and I go I don't get it uh, I want you know it, your your life is going by just taking in uh, if you're not going to take out, can I have, or put out, can I have some of your time to, to work on projects? Because there's so much to be ex done and experienced and travel and go to and all the rest of that. So those are some of the ones that I, I would say just avoiding that connection because it's, it's chronic. It's not going anywhere. And yep. if they're going to find help, it's probably going to be somewhere else and I don't need to do it. It's very draining. Um, but you know, the negativism, the consumerism is a very self-centered point of view. Yes. Right. It's about gimme, gimme. It's all about me, how my thoughts and how I'm frustrated. But it's not about caring. It's very hard. It's impossible to be caring and selfish simultaneously. Yes. Uh, almost. I would agree with you there. It's, it's, and, and I think in our North American mindset, uh, this is why I've taken all of my children uh, to uh, Nicaragua uh, on uh, humanitarian trips, hmm. building community centers and homes and that sort of thing, because I wanted them to see outside of this North American yeah. box what else is going on there, and that here's these people that are dirt poor but incredibly happy and fulfilled, and they it would blow their minds. Well, they don't have, and they don't have, and they don't have. How come they're happier than me? Well, maybe there's a lesson here. Maybe there's something else, you know? Right. And that's what we're getting back to is the consumerism is we yes. pile it on. We become essentially enslaved to that system. And well, that's not happiness. Happiness no. is not found there. No. And fulfillment. And, you know, I would point to, uh, you know, down there, they make these wonderful hammocks. And I would point as we're driving through the country and I'd say to these new teams, because I would take different teams down, uh, you know, look at the folks there. It's siesta time, mom and dad, kids, extended family. They're in the hammocks out on the front porch and they are enjoying them. Yeah. I'd say, I bought one of those hammocks last year. I have yet to lie in it because I just am too busy and I don't have time to relax like that. I said, if time is money, who's richer, me or them? Yeah, absolutely. You know? and, and you kind of have to flip uh, things on their heads and go, what are we doing? You know, And like you just said, uh, if this last couple of years have done nothing else, it, it's been helped people to say, I can unplug and still enjoy life. You know, yeah. I can, I don't have to do all. And and so maybe there's some really good things that are kind of come out of this to say, hey, why not pursue something new? You know, why not? There was an island uh, off the coast of Washington uh, in the San Juan Islands um, that where the dump is, people would essentially bring furniture and other items they didn't use any longer. Um, and it was called like the flea market or something, but essentially people just left things there for others to take. And many people were just furnishing their homes, um, with things people didn't want. Yeah. And it was a very different approach, uh, not fancy, uh, furniture and whatever it might be, or people just a lot of bartering and just helping of each other. And this is how a lot of people could afford to live on this Island off the coast of Seattle. And it was a very different mindset. And so because of you're not spending all your money uh, on stuff, 
you don't have to make that much money on right. you know for stuff. Yep. And so a lot of people are just working part time or doing whatever, and you don't need the major income to survive them. And so the the person I was talking about was basically laughing at us back east. Yeah. And said, you guys have it all backwards. Yeah. You know, because you have all these monthly expenditures and car payments and house payments and everything else. Um, you really do become trapped. And I have a saying, like, if you own something, you go buy something. Well, it, it owns you also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very much so. So anyway, Van, so it's been such a pleasure. Why don't you tell the people again uh, where they can find you? And I'm sure that a lot of people would love to come listen to the, the fantasy podcast. So where can they find you, my friend? Well, again, online at core series, C O R S E R I E S dot com. You'll find the fantasy core series books. If you like ancient wisdom, try the story at the scroll dot CA, not dot com, because I'm in Canada dot CA. So that's the scroll, just all one word. You can check that out. Um, people that want to, you know, get a hold of me can just send me an email, info core series at gmail dot com. And uh, be glad to hear what you're seeing thinking and interact with you that way well again i love what you're doing with the the, the podcast and the the oral tradition and really turning it upside down in a sense and really bringing it to people in a way that that oral tradition has sort of died out in many ways so this is a lovely way uh to kind of bring it back to life yeah and i hope it catches fire i hope there's a lot of people out there with a good story in their sock drawer that's just sitting there not going anywhere that'll go out go on to buzzsprout uh you know you pay 12 bucks a month yep. and it it pushes all your stuff out there get a mic it's not that expensive read your story find some people that want to follow you and then start honing it and be encouraged like yeah why why leave it buried it, it shouldn't be buried let it yep. live what was the backstory um you kept mentioning Oh, those are also in that uh, coreseries.com uh, website or all you know, on any podcast. It's called Backspace. And I restrict myself to one page of material. And I give a four minute, like, how did this story start? Why did I have that operation in the hospital? Why did that come that way? And as I go through the story, I'll explain how the writing process is happening. So a couple of weeks ago, I did one because one of my main actors, it was actually Kate, actors I call them, isn't that interesting, uh, talked back to me in the middle of a chapter. And I could just almost hear her say, what are you writing this for? I don't like this. I don't want to do this scene. I'm not going to. So I wrote a whole little backspace on how she uh, kind of, you know, came back at me with, uh, rewrite this. This isn't good. And so it's the process of the writing process. It's backspace stories on how this chapter came to be. It's just great fun. So kind of the background of a scene or yeah. a story. Yeah. But that's connected to the podcast? Yeah, it's connected to the stories itself. So the one I released were on chapter 38 of the medallion, I think, and something had happened in there that required a rewrite. So I explained the process of why that came about. So for your people that like to know the backstage, it, it comes from my theater background. It's the backstage, it's the backstage tour. But I see. in in this case, it's the backspace because it's the writing of what came before that. So yeah. it's, it's great. I enjoy it. And uh, hopefully people will enjoy those as well. Yeah. Well, so nice speaking with you. Uh, Vance Newdorf, the, the core series. Uh, check him out uh, and listen to his stories. I'm sure it's fascinating. Uh, you know, people love audiobooks and Yeah. You know. It was great to be with you today. That was That was an enjoyable chat. Well, thank you very much, and you have a great day. You too. Take care. You well, Vance.